Good evening. This is um, part of the Australiana Fund's third Narratives of Nations Symposium and the fourth lecture in our online Zoom lecture series. We're delighted to offer these lectures to members, supporters and friends of the Australiana Fund. My name is Caroline Johnston and I'm a member of the Council of the Fund, Chair of the Events and Marketing Committee and Chair of the Victorian Committee. Tonight I begin um, by taking a moment to acknowledge the peoples of the Bunurang and Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the land from which I'm Zooming this evening. I'd also like to pay respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians present. Um, we always like to showcase something from the collection and behind is a set of Blackwood Hall chairs by William Hamilton circa 1845, commissioned by Thomas Chapman, who was Premier of Tasmania, and these chairs were in his property, Sunnyside. As we're in a Zoom meeting tonight, I suggested to enhance your viewing, you put your speaker, your Zoom screen to speaker view, so you can see our speaker speaking and then see the presentation when shared. Please also keep yourself on mute until the end of the lecture. We also do, do mention that as these presentations can be dense with images, there may at times be a delay in moving from one slide to the next, and I hope you'll bear with us on that. But of course, we aim to provide as good an experience for you as, we, as the internet will allow. Now, for any questions you might have during the talk, please send them through by clicking the chat button, and we'll try to answer as many as possible. Now on to tonight. We're so delighted to have Dr. Katrina Quinn presenting the lecture called The Emergence of the Australian Interior Designer, Craft, Commerce and Interdisciplinary Practices, 1920 to 1945. And about Dr. Quinn, she researches and teaches design history at UNSW at Sydney. As a former curator at we Living Museums, she developed the first retrospective exhibition on an Australian interior designer, Marion Hall Best in 1993. Katrina has published and lectured widely on interior design history, including recent chapters in The Other Moderns, Sydney's Forgotten European Design Legacy, 2017, and Margot Lua's No Limits, 2022. And we'll be sending links to some of that material um, tomorrow. And she was twice awarded bursaries by the Design History Society to present at their international conferences. Her 2021 PhD on the role of the client in post-war interior design won UNSW's J.M. Freeland Prize for a significant research contribution. You'll have to agree she's got a, a wonderful background for presenting tonight and I'm sure you'll all you'll join me in welcoming Dr. Quinn and thank her for joining us tonight. Trina, over to you. Thank you, Caroline, and a very uh, warm thank you to the Australian Australiana Fund and members, especially Jennifer Sanders, for inviting me to present tonight and for uh, this what, what should be a very regular thing to include interior design history within these ideas of narratives of nation, but is still something that we need to single out as worthy of applause for the Australiana Fund to do so. Uh, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the Camaragal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of the land on which I live and work, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I'll just, just bear with me and I'll just share my screen and get us going. Sorry, we did have a, oh, here we go. Had a few problems earlier, but I think it's going to be fine. So when Ruth Lane Poole was hired in 1926 to consult on the interiors at the lodge, it was not as a decorator, but a, quote, furniture specialist. A hard to define role that by the end of the decade had emerged in interwar Australia as the new occupation of interior decoration. Poole's uh, slightly younger contemporary, Margot Lewis, saw interior decoration as offering what she called scope for the individual, and the press advocated its suitability as a job for women, rooted as it was in the domestic sphere and feminine values of taste, artistic expertise and fashionability. Now this was at once liberating and confining, as the occupation was quickly gendered, 
and eventually consigned a low status in history's hierarchies. My talk tonight surveys a broader context for Ruth Lane Poole in terms of the embryonic profession, while engaging with some of the key debates of the design history canon. I want to consider early Australian interior decorators through the lens of the gendering of craft and design practices and their fluidity between interwar design disciplines. I also want to provoke some thought about what some of the important historical considerations are when we talk about women and interwar interiors and so-called female occupations, which continues to underpin biased historical and contemporary narratives. Museums, historians and academics, and I would argue organisations such as the Australiana Fund, have an important role in the generation of ideas beyond the limitations of a canon of heroic, usually male, designers and the pre preferential hierarchies of modernism. As American design curator Glenn Adamson has said, if you don't have this happening, the ideas that end up in circulation are the stereotypes and the reductive ones. The ones used for corporate interest and have no criticality in them become empowering. But first, a word on interior design historiography. When we refer to interwar interiors, we're talking about a field that has been revealed by key scholars such as Peter McNeil, Penny Spark and Anne Massey as gendered feminine and thus tainted by connotations of amateurism, innate taste, transience, fashionability and superficiality. The impact of the contemporary gendering of the occupation is important because it has also been established as key to historical admission. Interior design history is substantial and meaningful, but this scholarship is negligible. There has yet been no Australian survey history published and international histories have taken in Australia into limited or no account at all. To give you some context of the significance of the CMAG Ruth Lane Poole exhibition from last year, this was only the third staged on an Australian interior designer. And the first two were on the same woman, Marion Hall Best. My recent PhD on the role of the client was in fact the first dissertation on Australian post-war interior design in the last 30 years. And I believe the first PhD ever specifically on post-war interior design practice, not a claim I'm proud to make. These preferences have largely been determined by architectural history's belief in the preeminence of modernism, often obscuring feminine tastes, aesthetics and production. If we take our cues solely from the styles evidenced by history's favoured few, we'd be forgiven for thinking that embryonic modernism under the influence of Scandinavia and Bauhaus architecture was the only interior design practice of consequence in Australia between the wars. A few fortunate figures tend to be included, but only where their association with the fine arts has legitimised their work. This limits our understanding of a more nuanced history of the interchange of design ideas in a field that in practice was highly diverse and demonstrates pivotal societal shifts in which women, both amateur and professional, played an important role. With that in mind, let's turn to our interwar designers and decorators and consider what we know about some of them and importantly, what we don't know and why. Ruth Lane Poole's context was at the intersection of craft and design. So we begin by remembering that the 19th century view of craft and design was as different and opposite. Craft as something physical that is manual and mechanical and design as something logical and intellectual that is a refined planning process. But there was also a growing belief in the benefits of collaboration between the two. Some gender divisions meant certain craft work was often performed by women recreationally and creatively as both amateurs and professionals, while other fields continued to be dominated by men, especially furniture design and architecture, which was almost exclusively practiced by men. As always, we must look at design histories through the context of important economic and geopolitical events and shifts. 
In the aftermath of World War I, Australia still had a strong allegiance to Britain for trade and cultural leadership, which was of course to undergo dramatic change in the following decades. The war prompted social change in terms of women's participation in the workforce. And in the era of recovery that followed in the 1920s, there were greater expectations from some women about their standard of education and employment. The Great Depression in 1929 impacted design and industry with the built environment particularly hard hit. Greater numbers of middle-class women also earned an income often while balancing home and childcare responsibilities, which favoured home-based craft and design occupations. This was then followed by a slow recovery in the 1930s, which was only ended by the manufacturing industrial demand fueled by World War II. Between the wars, it was amongst the members of the arts and crafts societies that interdisciplinary practice began to emerge and professionalise. In Sydney and Melbourne, members held regular exhibitions of crafts such as lacquer work, embroidery and pottery, and both groups ran successful shops selling members' work all year round. Although these were not confined to female members, there was also a long tradition of exhibitions of women's work, and this phenomena underpinned a developing field of women who earned their living making what we might now call design, but then was often called handicraft or applied art. Society members frequently travelled overseas and were well aware of emerging trends in international arts, crafts and design. As Margaret Betteridge has explained in the previous lecture, this group and their exhibitions were crucial to Ruth Lane Poole's swift establishment of her credentials in Melbourne. So the links between craft and design were seminal to this transitional phase and new occupations such as interior decoration offered fresh opportunities for women in commerce, autonomy and self-expression. And I just briefly show you this slide from a, 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 a magazine from 1930 called uh, uh, Women's Mirror, and because I've highlighted some of the key characteristics at this time people believed was associated with this new profession of interior design. Um, that this was about achieving a home with good taste, that um, she worked this, this um, particular designer, Mrs. Smith, in conjunction with an architect. This was happening all the time in the mid-century, but it's, it's not a practice that has received any attention at all these collaborations. More often the focus was on the, the kinds of characteristics that Mrs. Smith herself is remarking on here, which she says that aptitude for the right thing in the right place is more of a gift than anything else. So this idea of a natural talent, of an innate skill, aptitude and she's accustomed in, in her own home to the handling of good furniture and beautiful things. So she's bringing an expertise to the client. She also talks about self-expression and finally she talks about uh, the congeniality of uh, working with people. So that some of the that just absolutely nails it in terms of the the theories about the new profession that were going on at the time. Oops, sorry, let's go back. Uh, however, as Peter McNeil has described, unlike architecture, a profession with recognised standards and organisations, interior decorating in the 20s and 30s was actually ill-defined and not well recognised. A steep growth in professional organisations, standards and codes of ethics was not to come until the 1950s with the foundation of the Society of Interior Designers of Australia. Despite this, there was much activity in the burgeoning field, encouraged by a range of women's magazines, so not only magazines like this one, the, the Women's Mirror, but also feminist, feminist magazines and ones with more artistic content. And I would include in that the commentary by Ruth Lane Poole that we saw in the previous lecture when she identified interior decorating in, as a career in which women could be useful. Middle class women came to dominate the field, aligned with domesticity and the private sphere of the home, where the woman also became the primary consumer of furnishings. The social status of the interwar interior decorator was also highly valued, since, as in this article and others, they were promoted as purveyors of art and taste over fashion, and uh, they were thence hired by an aspirational middle class to advise on that. 
This change in work pattern saw a commercial shift away from the masculine furnishing men who were attached to furniture, upholstery and department stores towards this newly feminised occupation. And it followed that by the 1920s and 30s, the term itself, interior decorator, the nomenclature was constructed as feminine, amateur and intuitive, elided with fashion and applied arts and hence routinely trivialised and gendered. So who else was there and what kind of work were they doing and what did it look like? This is Margaret Lord. She was uh, an Australian interior designer who had a big career in London in the 1930s doing commercial work. When she returned from London in 1940 to Sydney, she observed it was difficult to see professional interior decoration there, such as she had known in London. And she was disappointed by the ready-made furniture available in department stores from imitation Jacobean to what she called phony modern. And a couple of slides here show you this transition literally in place, the David Jones fur art furnishes upholstery and decorators uh, catalog from 1895, um, which is this, this previous very masculine oriented uh, out furnishing men outfitters of the department stores. Moving towards an interior that might be familiar to some of you at Calthorpe's house, when Mrs. Calthorpe went to uh, Beard Watson in 1926 and put in her order, she would certainly not pull this look together herself. She was ordering it with the help of the furnishing department. And finally, Molly Gray, and you can even see, I think, the styling of her personally, let alone the room that she's in, that this um, shift has occurred. Uh, despite the, the faults described by Margaret Law, department stores had in fact adapted, as we can see there, from furnishing men whose role was practical, commercial and advisory towards in-house interior design studios offering planning and design services. So it was within these furnishing departments that interior decorators were able to offer this full service and women such as Molly Gray here at David Jones and another woman, um, for example, Joyce Brown at Anthony Horden's flourished. In the 1920s and 30s, architects also increasingly became involved in the specification of interiors. Now, clearly, uh, the complete control by an architect was one of the fundamental tenets of the modernist movement and the modernist project. But I wanted to use these images to show you that, in fact, it was a diverse range of architectural practitioners who were crossing disciplinary boundaries, including, for example, Australian architect uh, Raymond McGrath, who had a very successful commercial career in London between the wars, um, Bernard Sutton in Melbourne and his protege Noel Coulson, and modernist architects such as Arthur Baldwinson and traditionalists such as William Hardy Wilson, and then uh, you've got complete interior fit outs as such as the one we can see here by Marion Marnie Griffin. So it's not about belonging to a single aesthetic or about belonging to modernism. This was something that was across the board. In the late thirties, the beginnings also of a huge wave of immigration was already underway, which was to have a significant effect on cultural and societal change in Australia. Many were Jews from Poland, escaping Russian anti-Semitism, later Hungarians, Czechs and Austrians fled escalating Nazism and Soviet oppression. Amongst the refugees were numerous architects and designers trained in the technical schools and workshops of Eastern Europe's design hubs, such as Brunn, Vienna and Budapest. And these also began to have an impact on custom design furniture and interiors available in Sydney and Melbourne in particular. Some women did, of course, also become qualified architects from the 1920s, and scholars such as Bronwyn Hanna and Julie Willis have attempted to redress their historical relegation. In this context, I want to compare how history has treated two sisters. Uh, Ellis Nosworthy, whose uh, house you can see uh, designed the bottom right-hand corner and the interiors by uh, her sister, Cecily Guns. Ellis was one of three women amongst the first eight graduates in architecture from Sydney University in 1922. 
She ran her own practice until the 1960s, and while hardly a prominent figure in the canon, historians have widely acknowledged her as a pioneer figure and for her contribution to designing community housing projects. Her, Cecily, her sister Cecily Guns was a London-trained interior designer, and she was employed in Sydney by the architecture firm uh, Stevenson and Meldrum from 1936 onwards. She designed interiors, furniture, textiles, and graphics for hospitals, boardrooms and offices. But nothing has been published on her work and the Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences, which has her archive, describes her online as a rarity as a woman involved in design. Now clearly this was not the case. The rarity lies in overlooking or misunderstanding the significance of breadth of design practices women were working in. to education. Education in interior design and decoration was patchy in the 1920s. And some women studied via correspondence courses or at art schools, often with the imperative to train in a field of applied art in order to earn a living during the depression. By the mid 1920s, it was technical training at RMIT and East Sydney Technical College. It was from those two institutions that the first interior design, design courses sprang from their applied art and design studies. Oops. Beginning at East Sydney Tech College, uh, from 1924, Phyllis Shilito, arguably, arguably Sydney's most influential design educator, developed a diploma course that attracted women looking for careers in applied arts, graphic and mural, mural design, relief carving, textile design and use of colour. You can see her there in the centre of that image, enrolling young women uh, in the early 1940s. Um, which by which time these courses had evolved to incorporate interior, industrial and fashion design. The London trained Shalito had travelled extensively in Europe in the 20s and 30s and her curriculum reflected the theories and methodologies of the Deutsche Werkbund, which had strong links to Mies van der Rohe, Le Corbusier and Gropius, and the Ulm School of Design, especially colour theories of Johannes Itten and Joseph Albers. Students learnt to make her colour wheel and followed a curriculum influenced by Bauhaus principles, including a foundational year combining art, craft and design. In a full-time five-year diploma course, interior designers often studied three nights a week at the East Sydney Tech while they worked in a firm or studio during the day. The Gordon Technical College in Geelong also practiced interdisciplinary pedagogies. The history of two of their students in the 1920s offers a salutary tale of the gendering of emergent design occupations. This is Noel Coulson on the left and his wife May Fiddies. They both trained in the identical architecture course at the Gordon Tech from 1919 to 1923. Their training was remarkably broad, and as well as architectural subjects, they learned to weave, to make lacquer work, lino printing, graphic design, and textiles. One of them, one of these two, who only completed two years of study, became a registered architect, an associate of the Royal Australian Institute, and had a long and successful career designing lavish houses and interiors until the mid 1970s. The other one, who was the better student, completed four years of architecture, but had great difficulty getting a place as a student article to a firm. And despite their qualifications, never registered and ceased all architectural work in 1953. I think you can probably guess which one was which. Yet, neither Noel or May had the career paths you might've expected from this simple breakdown of their trajectories. The detailed history is a reminder of the interwar period's inherent disruptions. Noel had an easier start because getting an article position was much more straightforward for a middle-class man in the 1920s. May finished her course in 1923, but was unable to get an architectural uh, article, an articleship until 1929. And then she lost that with a year owing to the Great Depression. But because of the breadth of her training, she was able to get work immediately as a senior designer at Semco, a progressive feminist company making embroidery patterns in Melbourne. Uh, 
and she stayed there until 1941. Meanwhile, Noel also lost his job in 1929 and supported himself by making woven fabrics for couture fabric house, fashion house Le Louvre and working as a foreman on building sites. He eventually registered as an architect in 1945 and set up his own firm. His wife May worked for him on architectural drafting, but by 1953, I think you know what's coming, she stayed home to look after her elderly mother and her child. So we can see from that story, the integration of craft design and technical training had many advantages, especially in economically challenging times. And it's interesting to think about how these multitudes of practical, creative crafting skills might influence a designer's mature practice. We also reflect on the fact that even though women were not expressly barred from the architecture field, the hurdles were higher from, for them. And without official recognition through registration and degree qualifications, the important roles tend to be left out of historical accounts. Now, many of the Coulson's contemporaries also worked across interrelated fields. And some of these uh, figures, you're going to know their names much, uh, really quite well. Uh, this is partly by economic necessity, but also representing a confluence which curator Michael Leckes described. Australian modernist artists of the 20s and 30s did not generally differentiate, but moved easily between fine art, commercial art and design, interior decoration and furniture design. These artists were promoted by publications like The Home, which emphasised that each had the right taste and sensibility to improve the standard of design in Australia. For example, Michael O'Connell Michael O'Connell, sorry, uh, was a watercolour artist who moved into designing and manufacturing concrete garden furniture and was deeply involved with the Melbourne Arts and Crafts Society, eventually became a prominent textile designer and printer. Um, O'Connell's textiles were often exhibited and sold with furniture designed by Fred Ward, who also started out in Melbourne in the 1930s. And Cynthia Reed's modern furnishing store in Melbourne provided a retail outlet for these and also furniture by Sam Attio. And some of you may have been to this, the Brave New World exhibition at the NGV, where uh, a, a, just a really outstanding collection of um, uh, furnishings belonging to May Casey have been um, curated by, by John McPhee and assisted for their acquisition for the gallery. And the Reed and Atio story was woven into that history as well. If we look at the graphic designers who produced covers for the home magazine in the 1920s and 30s, which you may also know quite well, we see the work of Thea Proctor, Hera Roberts, Adrian Faint. All of these people were involved in interior design and decoration, as was, and then Douglas Anand. So you see him working on graphic design, textiles and mosaics. These designers embody the collaborative multidisciplinary characteristics of this merger of craft and design taking place between the, the wars. And not, not forgetting this advisory role on taste was always a sort of a, an undercurrent uh, with, with the designers operating in this space. Another central locale in interwar art and design histories is the Burdekin House exhibition, a series of display rooms staged in Sydney in 1928. Colour, decoration and pattern coexisted with Bauhaus shapes in furniture and influences ranged from a spare Japanese aesthetic to German functionalism and French modern. All were seen as more or less modern. It was the artists who were promoted as the authors of each room, but it's questionable how many of them actually had a, a substantial interior design practice. The information is sketchy on some of them in, in, in that sense. In other words, a significant event, but unreliable as a representation of the field of practice. It's really important to acknowledge at this point that these are very select individuals who tend to have been given substantial historical attention, legitimised by their artistic associations, or in Cynthia Reid's case, the mythologising of this pioneer modernist figure, but that there has been little perspective on the real importance of their work, since the broader field has not been documented and remains largely unaccounted for. 
Margaret Jay, on the other hand, whose Darlinghurst studio and retail opened in 1925, is in fact considered the earliest known Australian interior decorator. But as McNeil has pointed out, her lack of social and artistic credentials and her fame as a, or perhaps I should say notoriety as a savvy commercial retailer has hindered her historical acknowledgement. Many others whose careers peaked during the post-war boom began in the 1920s and 30s, including Francis Burke, Marion Hall Best, June Carney and Mel de Boulay. And in a field dominated by women, some of the earliest and most enduring studios were managed by men. Reg Riddell, Clive Carney, Stuart Lowe, Derek Dean, all began as decorators in the interwar era. And Francis Burke and Marion Hall Best decide their histories are yet to be written. Now I'd like to finally uh, move on to the final stages of this talk by looking a little bit more closely at two women who exemplify this transition I've been talking about from commercial applied art into professional interior design um, between the wars. A figure I think that is you may well know. Thanks to two major exhibitions and publications and an abundance of online material on her work, Marion Hall Best remains the only interior designer who has achieved any level of historical recognition. Best was Australia's most influential decorator of the 20th century with a vast business employing dozens of staff, including two women architects, with a major import agency bringing the most advanced furnishings from around the world, while fostering many Australian designers and working on hundreds of projects locally and in Asia. She helped found the Society of Interior Designers of Australia in 1951, and her work and archives are in the, the National Gallery of Australia, the National Gallery of Victoria and Sydney Living Museums. She had a long career from the 1920s to the 1970s, but tonight we'll focus on her training and work in the 20s and 30s, which characterise this integration of craft and design. Marion Burkett was born in Dubbo in 1905, educated at the mildly progressive Frencham School, and in the 1920s, while working as a nurse and raising her young family in Sydney, she became involved in various art and craft activities. She studied design with Thea Proctor's private art school in what was likely a broad course of study, including colour theory and theatre set decoration, was probably there that she came across uh, Rudermeister's colour wheel, which she was also known to, to have used. Around the same time, oh, a little bit later actually, slightly later, uh, in the, the mid to late 1930s, Marion was also deeply affected by seeing the touring ballet Russe de Monte Carlo, whose sets and costumes were designed by leading European artists such as Matisse. And she was not alone in this. This is an incredibly uh, influential event in Australian cultural life. For many Australian audiences, it was their first contact with European modernism in art. Although her husband was a reasonably successful dentist, Marion, like many middle-class women in the depression, wanted and I think needed to make an income and began, began supplying embroidered articles to David Jones. She learned to embroider in a Chilean style using bold colors and large scale flowers in bright walls taught by June Scott Stevenson, a leader in the Women's Industrial Art Society, which encouraged women artists in all kinds of work including window dressing, pottery, textiles, woodblock printing, jewellery and glove making. In the late 1920s, Marion Hall Best began to decorate whole interiors, moving from making individual crafts to planning whole schemes. This started in the domestic but quickly moved to commercial work for clubs, university colleges and most famously an apartment block number seven Elizabeth Street, which was a, a um, high rise building designed by Emil Soderston and for which she was prepared in terms of the, the level of the quality of her drawings by having spent one year studying architecture at Sydney University to, for this express purpose. She didn't intend to become an architect. It's important to recognize that here with these early commissions, her social position uh, not only reinforced her authority in the press, which was th that attention was growing, she was established as an arbiter of taste, but it provided the connections for these early commissions. 
She was friends from childhood with the Hordens, the Tooths, the Blackslands, the Bullmores, the Bronowskis and the Anderson Stewarts. These people were the Sydney establishment and could connect her to various clubs, uh, university colleges, hospitals, where she got these commissions, which were mainly commercial. And this in turn attracted her later clients from amongst the aspirational parvenues in Sydney, who then funded really some of her most adventurous work by the 1950s and 60s. Best often used fabrics by one of Australia's most successful commercial studio textile designers, Frances Burke, who had worked in advertising before setting up her own textile uh, printing and eventual shop, also selling modern furniture and offering some interior design services uh, in collaboration with architects. And once again, we see craft and design merging in a new field of work for women. I just have a shot there on screen of the new book by Nanette Carter and Robin Oswald Jacobs, if you're not aware of it, about Frances. Francis Burke, it's really substantial. Craft practices were fundamental to Best's interior design business, which by the late 30s included a small workroom and shop in Wallara. And as part of this, she herself started a textile design company called Marion Best Fabrics in 1939, not a great year to open a business, and wrote in the promotional brochure, now is the time to prove the value of the artist to industry in creating new ideas of good design. She employed mostly women artists to design patterns, which were screen printed by a company called Gilks. The artists commissioned included an interesting figure, her own sister, Dora Sweetapple, who also worked across numerous craft and design practices. She was a silversmith, painter, textile designer, mural artist, window dresser, interior designer, teacher, lecturer, and journalist, including acting as contributing editor to the magazine Arts, Architecture, and the Modern Home. And here, if we just go back to that, the, on the right, her fabric design hibiscus for Marion Best Fabrics. And if you have a look at these, are a couple of exhibition rooms that Marion Hall Best did for a charity show. Um, at David Jones in 1941, the fabric is there on the left. Very interesting knowing uh, the strength of the colour when you see an image like that. And lastly, we're going to look briefly at Mar Margot Lewis, uh, who became very famous in the 1950s and 60s as an abstract expressionist painter, but whose earlier career as a designer and craft practitioner was until recently almost completely overlooked. And I say until recently, because I'm so proud that this year, the new book, Margot Lewis, No Limits, was launched with a really substantial piece of research from me, a chapter on her interior design practice. So if you're interested in her and to hear more about her and more of the detail of that, um, uh, Sonia has the, the links where you can have a look at the book and maybe buy it. Margot was born Margot Plata in 1908, the daughter of the German-born painter Adolf Plata, who died when she was young, leaving the fa family financially precarious. Her first job was a, as a cadet commercial artist for the Daily Telegraph, followed by an apprenticeship learning poker work in a place she described as a horrible backyard woodwork studio. At night, she studied painting with Dattolo Rubo, where she met Gerald Lewis, the, who, Lewis, who was to become her husband and also the eminent sculptor. With his financial support, she brought out her partners in the poker work business and gradually developed the Sussex Street premises as a design studio called Margot's Pottery, even though with great confidence, she had never made a pot and had no skills in that area. What Margot did next, I think was highly significant since it challenges our ideas about craft practitioners as creative authors, whose hand on the crafted object and time spent making it lend some of its value. She began to order pottery in various shapes and designs, but did not make them or even sketch them. Instead, she went to one of Sydney's biggest commercial pottery factories and standing over the potter at the wheel directed the shape she wanted. The pots were then delivered to her studio in Sussex Street, where her staff of young women sprayed colour on each pot, again as Margot directed. Margot's pottery quickly had a wide distribution network all over New South Wales, Victoria, 
Queensland and South Australia and became very successful, surviving the worst years of the depression in 1930 and 31. Margot then spent 1934 studying textiles in London with some of Britain's leading designers at the Central School. She also traveled in Germany and everywhere was most interested in craft shops, department stores, furniture and interior decoration. She was a critical observer of some of London's leading designers, including decorator Betty Joel and uh, fabric designer Marion Dawn. But it's also clear that their work and their independent decorating and retail businesses provided aspirational role model, uh, models for her own. Her friends included other Australians, Elaine Haxton, who designed textiles for Marion Hall Best, but at that time was working as a commercial art artist in the advertising agency J. Walter Thompson, and also the artist Eileen McGrath, who introduced her to the work of her architect brother, Raymond McGrath, who, whose work we've already seen. So we can see that the global circulation of ideas embraced architecture, retail, and interiors. And magazines, I want to point out, were particularly important um, to these women and to Margot especially. She had very, very little money and even on a tiny budget, she assembled a reference file at this time in London in the 30s that she kept her whole life. So she collected magazines and then she couldn't afford the books. So she collected the pamphlets, the promotional pamphlets about the, the books. Uh, and it shows us that she was in connection with a really uh, quite a wide range of important writers and uh, important ideas and in interior de decoration. On her return, Margot added textile production to the pottery at the Sussex Street Studio and began to be aware of the ways these crafts could be customized to match and integrated together into larger interior schemes. To explore this more fully, Margot opened an interior design consultancy and shop, which she called Natanda in Rose Street, Sydney, which was a hub of craft and design. Like BEST, this was a service offering complete design, not only inclusive, but fundamentally based on craft. It's impossible to imagine one of her interior schemes without these, these three components, furniture, textiles, and pottery, all crafted by her. She also began designing furniture. And in this, she was inspired by the Finnish modernist, Alva Alto, whose work she had seen in London. And you can see up there that this is the Sunspan House. So she, she wrote home to her mother about seeing the ideal home exhibition, the Wellscoat Sunspan House, which she described was um, decorated with Swedish blonde furniture, but it, it, was a, it was actually kitted out with furniture by Alva Alto. So we know for certain that she saw this and these are the, the types of things that she would have seen are on the screen. Um, although by now but married to Gerald Lewis, who is a member of the affluent Farley and Lewis Cement Mix Company. Hang on, I've got, sorry, I've got one more picture of her, of her furniture there, the day bed. Um, Margot herself had limited social connections in Sydney to support her interior design business, in contrast to Marion Hall Best's success at exactly the same time. Instead, with close connections to Arthur Baldwinson and Sydney Anchor, it appears she relied on architects as her main clientele. But recovery in the built environment from the depression was very slow. She found it hard to attract greater sales in what was acknowledged as a small market in Sydney and the shop closed in 1939. Her pottery business, however, flourished until 1942. By the end of the war in 45, Margot had committed to serious training as a painter at which she was very successful. Her involvement with interdisciplinary design did not stop and her, her artistic range included numerous modernist mosaic commissions. She continued to work with textiles and she eventually also produced plexiglass sculptures. Oh, that's, that is one more shot of her, her shop. Uh, while it, in conclusion, while it's gratifying to see how uh, people like Marion Hall play a bit best place in the historical canon has only strengthened since I first started researching and collecting her work in 1990, it's important to remember that there, there are many, many more designers, especially women, whose work has been left at the margins of history. We must question why this has happened and be conscious of ways to reframe our history writing to address it. 
One of the reasons interiors such as those by Ruth Lane Poole and other interwar decorators have been overlooked and even trivialized is that the preferences of historical frameworks have treated these practice pre practices prejudicially, dismissed by association with amateurism, fashion, the feminine or traditional aesthetics. A lack of curiosity about the complexities of the field has left the majority of practices out in the cold, dismissed as lost to history or as outside the modernist parameters that have de determined a designer's worth for inclusion. I'm wondering though, if we turn a similar eye on more recent interiors at the lodge, has history been repeating itself? I want to finish tonight with a provocation for you, the Australiana Fund, on Zara Holt's much maligned interiors at the Lodge, which featured in the first issue of Vogue's Guide to Living in 1967, with these photographs by Kerry Dundas and an uncredited text by Sheila Scotter. Although the entire scheme was in fact professionally designed by Marion Hallbest in collaboration with Reg Riddell, there is no mention of this by Mrs. Holt, who states, she acted as her own interior decorator in doing up the lodge and that the plans were carried out by the Department of Works using more taste than money in decorating. This in itself was blatantly misrepresentative as any scholar of best could easily spot the imported French silk foils and custom dyed carpets and certainly the signature glazed ceiling, all of which came at significant cost. At the time, uh, Mrs. Holt told Vogue Quote, at first I thought we must be careful to keep it conventional enough to make it acceptable to everyone, but that way you please nobody. Our visitors like it. It's this aspect though, Mrs. Holt's taste, that came under scrutiny and still comes under scrutiny. She was persistently mocked by later Prime Minister's wives, everyone from uh, Tammy Fraser to Anita Keating to Hazel Hawke, and in the press. And in fact, in 1993, the Sun Herald said that the phrase has instigated the official establishments trust to protect the PM's residences from the designing whims of first ladies such as Zara Holt. Now, the credit for this scheme as a highly individual taste of the Chatelaine, oops, underscore, ooh, underscored by what Vogue acknowledged as her, the quote, way with colour and flowers, obliterates several important things. For one, the professional skill of two accomplished and fashionable interior designers. And also, secondly, what was plausibly a complex collaboration with a client who was the owner of a successful Melbourne fashion label. But all of this just provides an excuse for ongoing trivialization. The story of Zara Holt and the Lodge is a reminder we need to be critical about the histories we are presented with. And we need to demand depth in the commentaries and histo histories based on evidence rather than discussions that mask aesthetic taste or social sneering. To return to the idea about how we approach these areas of practice, whether craft, art or design, as Glenn Adamson says, a historically informed view means less being led by the nose, only writing about things because of how they look or what's hip. And for myself, that's my final uh, message to you. I think the Holt, Best, Riddell interiors at the Lodge are long overdue for reassessment. Thanks. Katrina, thanks so much. That was so interesting on, and you've really brought to life many of those women designers and the context in which they were existing and, and obviously developing their skills and their clientele. I, I really think we've been treated to a really fascinating lecture. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just delighted you were able to join us. Um, and that was so interesting. That, so thank you. Now, please feel free to provide some questions. I'm going to start off in it soon, but you know you can keep on adding questions in the chat function. Or Katrina. Katrina, first up, were female student architects generally accepted by their male counterparts? And, and, you know, depending on the answer to that, you know, how also were firms and clients positioned in terms of using 
female architects and in fact, in fact female interior designers. So a couple of things to say about that. Um, uh, uh, Bronwyn Hannah and Julie Willis really uh, explain you know, the situation, the theory, the ideas that the, their history explained was absolutely borne out with what happened to Noel Coulson and May Fiddies, which was that it was a class and socioeconomic factor as much as it was a gender factor about participation for women as architects. As I said, uh, in theory, the um, the profession was open to them, but in practice, you needed to pay a substantial fee to be articled in the 20s. And th that was the system. So that was before, uh, you know, the universities um, became the primary educational uh, place for training as architects. So someone like Noel Coulson, whose father was a cabinet maker and his father was an architect and his father was a builder, they were already well off enough for him to purchase that place. Um, for May, in fact, the firm she ended up working for was reasonably prestigious, but it took her seven years to, to get that. And in that time, she had to earn a living. Her father had walked out on her mother uh, as a, when May was a young child, so her, her mother was effectively a single mother. She literally just didn't have the money to pay the fee. So there was that aspect of that as well. Um, I suppose also as an interior design historian, and I've looked a lot at the development of the profession in the post-war years particularly, probably what I'm more interested about in is this idea that um, it, it, there's a sort of a tension between the collaborations that over and over and over again, history, you know, the, the documents will tell us just as that, I wasn't even expecting to see that in that article in Women's Mirror. I was really interested in the way this decorator was talking about, um, you know, her authority on taste and all that sort of thing. And she throws in the line that she collaborates with, with architects. She works for, and Ancestry Guns has worked there in 1936, employed in, in, in a firm of architects. In 1947, Margaret Lord gives a big presentation to the Institute of Architects, um, New South Wales chapter, about what an interior designer does. And at the end of the talk, Sam Lipson heckles her and says, come on, you know, we just a shopper. You know, how does it feel to be the architect's fetch and carry man? And Margaret Lord replies, Come on, Sam, we all know, everybody in this room knows that every big architecture firm in Australia employs interior designers on their staff. So don't give me that. There's a role for this. You know, they're not just the shopper. For one thing, I'd argue that the shopper role, the intermediary role is uh, overdue for, for reassessment as well. There's a, it's a complex role. It's not just about going out and, and choosing something. Um, but for another, it shows that these collaborations were existing even while they were disrespected and that there were a lot of hostilities. This was all a territorial um, battle as architects under the influence of the modernist agenda were impeding more and more into the role of the interior designer and decorator. So various competitive elements at play. Quite. Yeah, and it, it you would have to think that gender must have played into that as well if you think that most of the architects in the firm are, uh, are males and that the interior designers were mostly women, um, but that, that was part of the issue as well. Katrina, what has surprised you most in your research into these women designers, um, you know, in terms whether whether it's a breadth of the things they did, their design practices, who they worked for? Um, mm, I think that uh, certainly uh, that, that knowledge of the collaboration is something that is, is really of growing interest to me. And I gave a, um, a talk for Sydney University for International Women's Day on a collaboration between Bill Lucas and Marion Hall Best. And that um, I then that is actually going to be part of a, a book the Design History Society is producing. So these hidden histories about these collaborations, how did they work? What were the issues with them? Why do we only know about one half of the team? Why, why do we not see these 
uh, the built environment as a as the collaborative uh, process that it actually is. Why do we always see it um, in terms of the, the hero genus creator? So I think learning more and more about those. I kind of find them, I, I find these women extremely inspiring too, particularly their persistence, the number of stages of their career is very interesting to me. Uh, Marion Hall Best was 47 years old when she founded the Society of Interior Designers of Australia. And I was 47 when I actually picked up that catalogue and, you know, I'd already seen it many years before, but reread it in the context of some new work. And uh, yeah, I was struggling to get back on my feet in terms of uh, my own working life. And I sat there in the State Library with this in front of me and thought, ah, all her best work was in front of her. <laughs> I, I found that really inspiring. Mm, yeah, quite, and quite heartening too. Yeah, heartening. Mm. I have a quest question which relates to um, the question is around the modern furniture design that's celebrated and collected predominantly by men. And we've heard that quite a bit in, in other, in, in other uh, lectures. Do you think that there are more designs by unknown women out there to discover or did the barriers of the day preclude their access to the field and therefore what they could design and have made? Yeah, I think that's that's a really good point. If we think about the male designers who are prominent, these are industrial designers, they're designing for mass production and that's the difference. It's not that they probably were, there could well have been women involved in that as well. But if you think of the type of um, interior design and the type of design work, these this group of women, which we can see that from the 20s on, it's really attracting women who want to work in this way and want to work in a related field. Um, this is um, a lot of it's custom design work. It's certainly working individually with uh, people's, you know, individual clients and their houses. This is not on a scale of mass production. So why do we, why do we um, preference mass production in the hierarchies? There's a, there's a number of reasons that feed into that. Uh, mainly because, as I said, the assumed preeminence of modernism over every other type of production. That's that's one thing. Um, the involvement of architects who occupy a higher place in, a, a, you know, higher status, um, and also the, the the fact that these these pieces are still circulating and then become collectible. So, as uh, I would argue, and I'm sure Jennifer would agree with me, as museums recede from a space they once led in terms of research and documentation and interpretation of our cultural life through through design that vacuum will surely be filled as Glenn Adamson has indicated and that in Australia I think that's filled by uh, commercial interests and collectors. And Jennifer Sanders has observed that um was a very terrific introduction and a survey of what is an important period in, in our design history. And I think, oh, and a comment here from Jennifer, a big thank you for your provocation regarding the Lodges Holt Hall Best Riddell interiors. Definitely worth more, more explanation and documentation of this period in the Lodges history. We should plan a, another presentation to bring that to life as well. So I would relish it, Jennifer. I've had I've had a file on on Zara Holt and that interior. It's always fascinated me ever since um, I found all the information, the material on it in Marion Hall Best's uh, scrapbook. Well, why did Marion Hall Best have this in her scrapbook with all her completed commissions? It was because she'd done the work. It's always sparked my interest and I've been looking for an avenue to, uh, to research it more for a long time. Love the opportunity, yeah. <laughs> and I think your comments, um about mass production versus customised production. It really, really connects with what you were saying about Marion Hall Best and the way, the making that she was doing. And all, you know, all of these female and male designers have been doing, well, many of those in that period were doing making as well as designing as well as advisory work. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe some of the things that the women were designing weren't as, maybe don't have a, as long a life as some of what the male may be. I'm not sure. You might have an observation. Um Look, I, I, I think it's more the industrial versus custom is the, is the issue. So these are private spaces. That's the other thing. So where it's private spaces, you, you um, there's 
they're not necessarily then shared in the public domain, which is not to say they're not photographed. They're often photographed in magazines and have an incredible secondary uh, influence on people. There's a secondary consumption happening through magazines, um, but so often the client's name isn't attached. Um, I think, you know, my PhD was looking at post-war practices, but really one of my big findings was that interior designers cannot be reduced to the arrangers of things, that their mediatory role of things, of objects, of design, and of taste and culture and all those things is highly significant to clients in their acculturation, their, their creation of a cultural identity, incredibly significant. But the but I also found that it is, there's, it's perfectly plausible and legitimate and can be supported to, to look at interior design, a, a design space, a designed interior as a piece of cultural production, just as you would a building. Mm. They're, they're more ephemeral and this is the ephemerality is another area that sort of has undermined their, their status. You know, architectures, well, it's, is it per, it's, it's more permanent than interiors. Anyway, I hesitate to call it permanent, but there's a kind of, you know, platonic permanence to the whole thing. And that's, that's why people become more attached to buildings. Yeah. And there is a bit of a trend to in within some of the art galleries to have spaces coordinated with various um, objects and textiles to make a bit more of an interior type feel, which I find interesting. When I um, I was looking at some of Margot Lewis' work and saw that um, the tapestry, which was designed by her called Wide Penetration, which is in the National Gallery's Know, Your, know My Name, mm. and, and that's the most beautiful work, which, you know, even being interested in tapestries that I hadn't heard of before, uh, and it was wonderful to see that displayed along with some of her other work. Mm. Quite, quite profound. Mm. I think that exhibition's been fantastic for just putting her name in front of people again and people are, you know, sparking that interest again. Mm. To, um, to what degree did you do you think that Australian society around that time in general and, and designers in particular were influenced by trends? You mentioned quite a few trends in the UK, but also in America. Where did you think the balance lies in in the, the influences from those other other societies? Yeah, absolutely. There's there's a it's it's a it's a totally um you know, it's it's just a it's a trope to think that Australia was constantly, you know, three months behind because that's how long it took for a ship to come. Um, you know, Hearst magazines were selling American magazines. You could buy them in Sydney. You could go to the State Library. You didn't even need to buy them, and you could see, you know, you could read Architectural Digest or The House Beautiful. Um, the home serialized Le Cabusier. I mean, it, this is just absolutely bonkers to think that Australians weren't familiar. And, and you know, the, the Institute of Architects, the, the traveling scholarship was really important for this type of thing that, that architect, you know, an architect, a young architect every year would travel often to, to England or to, to the continent. Uh, um, and come back and they were compelled to write a long report about it. You know, these things were, you know, and look at the number of Australians. You look at her circle, Margot Lewis circle in London, Raymond McGrath, Wells Coates. So they, these are really sophisticated, fascinating people. And we have some other comments too. Yes, oh, Anne's thanking you very much for a fascinating talk, bringing to light some many unheralded designers. And Margie Betridge, one of our earliest speakers, thank you. There's also a big scope for including the politics of decorating official residences. So, so lots of support and, um, you know, um, food for thought for future lectures. Now, I think it's probably time to wrap up tonight. Um, Katrina, I really think you have provided us with the most wonderful, interesting about the training of, of those designers, you know, the sort of craft design and technical training, which clearly informed their later practices. And, you, and as you said, their shifts in, in elements of, of the stages of their practices for all sorts of financial, economic, client-based reasons. I thought that was really interesting. You're really, you've really given us such a lot to think about and including some future ideas for, for lectures. So, Look, I really can't thank you enough for 
being with us tonight and presenting. It's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. And thank you also to everyone at the Australiana Fund who worked to put this lecture together and indeed the very suggestion of, of you as a speaker. For, for those that are listening in, um, there will be one more lecture in this series and bookings can be made through the Fund's event page. And we will have on the 2nd of November, Dr. John Murphy will be talking about Australian timbers, a history of their use in cabinet making. So that will be great. And as I said, bookings available through the Fund's website. Uh, also, you can copy buy a copy of the Fund's book, Collecting for the Nation, through the website. And as I mentioned earlier, we will give send some links to you probably tomorrow or um, shortly soon after this lecture with the links that Katrina has sent for us about Margot Lewis and a few others. So I think that, you know, keep stay posted for that. And Katrina, thank you again from all of us and good night to everyone. Um, so pleased you could join in this lecture series. Thank you very much. Thanks, Caroline.